Well, Ken, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thanks so much. I've just had so much fun getting to know you and, and learning more about your story. So welcome. Thank you. Awesome, Justin. It's great to see you again. Uh, we had a good time in Dallas, that's for sure. We did. You know, we it, it was so fun kind of just hearing your story, learning about your connection with uh, real estate and all the, I mean, you've been in it for years. Um, the deals that you've done with Robert Kiyosaki, you know, it's funny because uh, I just recently did a podcast with Tom Wheelwright and he spoke at our, our conference that we just had for the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind and private clients. And so it, it's really interesting seeing this world kind of just uh, come together here, but your yeah. story is incredible. And I, I'd love to have you share some of it here with our audience. Sure, sure. It's well, un untraditional, I think, you know, like, like everybody who gets into real estate, I don't, I don't know if it's ever intentional, but um, I, I, I quite simply, my, my, uh, my, I didn't grow up with a lot and my parents uh, were amazing, but, um, you know, we, we couldn't afford college for me for sure. And so I had a wrestling scholarship, thankfully, and I, I got in that way. And, and um, while I was there, um, I was um, offered by a friend of mine. He said, hey, we've got this 60 unit apartment building that uh, you can manage and, uh, and uh, I'll give you free rent if you do it. I'm, so, I, that's, I'm in, like I just said, you know, cause you know, I was racking up student debt, getting through school. I had a scholarship, but didn't pay for everything. And so, um, you know, just doing, you know, scrapping it out, trying to, trying to, you know, be, be a little more educated than I was. And uh, boy, did I have an education at that place. So, you know, I'm like, how hard could it be to collect rent and, uh, you know, pay a few bills and, and keep the place <laughs> clean, you know? And uh, boy, that was when my lesson started. I literally, I had to fire the manager and the two assistant managers. And, and I was there by myself. I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, but thankfully property management was kind of my, um, my ticket for my next eight, eight years, I, I ended up uh, kind of being in property management and I learned so much, but what I learned is I was creating all this value for other people. And one day I was like, you know, like I'm on the wrong side of the desk here. You know, I'm, I'm the guy that gets the call and says, Hey, here's a property. Would you clean it up and fix it up? And, and I'm grateful. I, I was, I managed, I, I don't even know exactly somewhere between 20 and thousand, 20 and 30,000 units up and down the Western United States. And, and so starting from Seattle area all the way down into California and Oregon. And, um, and, and, and uh, so when I actually got the courage, uh, you know, and, and decided I was gonna start owning properties, I didn't know what to do. And, and uh, I you know, started finding mentors and coaches and things like that. And, and that's how I got on the other side. And, and I, I started doing that in the late 90s. And I never looked back. And, and now we've, we've, we've acquired uh, a little over $3 billion in, in, in assets. Uh, right now I own about not quite one and a half billion. So we've sold off some of those. And uh, we, we do development, construction, uh, property management, all in-house. Uh, I've owned and built self storages and office buildings and condo projects and you know single family. And you know, but really my love is multifamily, which is, what I primarily do right now. And we have a company, uh, great company culture. I had to learn that, you know, once you learn how to scale a company, then you have to learn how to, you know, keep the people and keep them happy and all that. And so I poured myself into that and that's been a labor of love. And, and then of course, philanthropy comes from there. And, uh, you know, in the last five years, we hired a full-time director of philanthropy. So we give a lot. We're a very giving company. Uh, in fact, that is one of our core values is to be giving. And um, so we're involved in the community. We're having fun. We're making money for our investors and ourselves and our employees are having a good time. I'm enjoying all of it. I'm having fun. That's incredible. I mean, just the level of success you've had is spectacular to, I mean, anytime you're, you're mentioning, you know, something with the word billions, uh, you yeah. know that you're doing something right. You know, it's really funny because your reputation really precedes you on a few different levels. So the call right before this was with a lifestyle investor mastermind applicant. And I told him that I had to get running because, you know, we had our interview and he goes, oh yeah, I know him. 
uh, and he's from the Seattle area. He's, he started telling me some of your story about how you were, you know, doing property management in the early days and, you know, tied, tied up with, uh, with, with Robert. And it, it was cool hearing all that he knew. And he's actually from Redmond, Washington, or lives there right now. So, you know, just outside yeah. Seattle. Yeah. Um, and I spoke with someone else earlier that also knew you. And then, of course, when I was hanging out with, with Robert Kiyosaki at, uh, at the conference we were at, um, he just spoke so highly of you. I I've never heard him speak so highly of anyone before. And so that was really cool. And, you know, we had gotten a chance to connect before that, but it was cool here in his perspective and his story of you and how you guys met and the whole nine yards. So, uh, kudos to you for having such Thank an you. impeccable yeah. reputation. Thanks. Yeah. Well, as you know, I know you do this too. deliver on your promise and everything else works. Uh, you know, stop bullshitting yourself. That's you know, right. Tell, That's right. Tell the truth, be authentic, be transparent, and and uh, it will it will work out. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, it's interesting. My parents uh, weren't able to afford my education either. So it was, hey, figure out a way to go to college and to pay for it. Otherwise, you're not going to go. And bless their hearts, they they wanted to help so much. And even inside the first semester, they they did what they could to, like, be supportive and they're just incredible parents, but, um, I'm still the first person in our family, extended family to actually graduate from, from college. And, um, one of my professors at the school did what you did to a certain degree where he was property manager. He actually had an opportunity to buy the apartment complex as a college student and then manage it, which is just oh, good for him. Unbelievable. So I wish I would have gotten that early of a start, but <laughs> you got to run it you know, while you're in college, that that's incredible. Yeah, it was honestly, it was incredible experience. It just, uh, I, I was laughing the other day because I started as a paper boy, you know, when I was 14, that was my first job. I'd get up before school and, and deliver the Seattle Force Intelligencer at like 5 a.m. And and I did that every day for a couple of years. And, and um, I would knock on the doors, you know, and try to collect that, you know, the money, you know. And uh, the way that worked back then was that uh, you got to you got whatever you could collect over a certain amount. So they set a certain number, and then you got kind of that overage. So I was hustling, hustling, hustling to get to that point. And I was laughing because I there's an analogy between you know when I was collecting rent and collecting for you know a ten dollar newspaper. It was like the same excuses, almost exact. You know, it just didn't matter. And, and so the lessons of life, they're everywhere as you as you navigate things and, and you start to open your mind and see things for what they really are. So what was the first property that you bought? Yeah, so I started with a two bedroom, two bath using my own money. And, and you know, like a lot of people, that's how you start. And, and I, I was scared to death. It was all my savings and and, and I used it and it was cash flowing. I want to say like a hundred, you know, just north of a hundred a month. That's if it was full. So, uh, and, and I, and you know, I started, so I started small and, and made small mistakes, but I was in the property management business. So I actually was pretty good at keeping it full and managing it and all that. And, and then, then I started doing a, a bit of those, but then you know, I actually had some uh, duplexes, fourplexes and things like that. But then I jumped right up and bought a property that I was managing. <laughs> so and that I still own it. Uh, it's 182 units. I bought it over 20 years ago. It's in Sun City, Arizona, and I bought it for nine million dollars. And, and I didn't know how I was going to do it. Two million dollars down and seven million in debt, roughly. I, I think the thing's probably worth 50 now or something. Wow. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's because in Arizona, things are, you know, easily 300 to 300 a door right now. And uh, in some cases, 400 uh, a unit. And um, so and, and so that's how I started. And it was it was interesting. And it was all on a handshake from the guy that uh, allowed me to manage it. And he was one of the richest. He was on the Forbes list at the time in New York. And I called him up. And he, we did, I remember I was playing his day. I was walking through the Portland airport and I was on the phone with him. And, and uh, he, we cut a deal right then over the phone, almost in a handshake. And he's like, I'll send over the documents. And 
Uh, it's a long story behind it, but um, I had his trust uh, as being the property manager for a while because it, it had a rough start. I fixed it and uh, he had one investment in, uh, they, they, he owns over 10,000 units in Manhattan. So he had one little investment out in Arizona that he did for a favor. And, um, and I asked him if I could buy it and he sold it to me and the rest is history. That's incredible. What, what was the market for that? Like, was that a fair price? Was that, were you overpaying? Were you underpaying? I didn't overpay. I don't think I underpaid. Um, what, what, what I, uh, it was a senior, it still is a senior property. It's in a 55 age restricted community. So we had very low turnover. Um, and what the issue when, um, when I, when I came on was that all the downstairs were full and all the upstairs weren't for obvious reasons, right? The seniors didn't want to walk up the stairs. So what I did was I made the downstairs more expensive and that which drove the upstairs, you know, and again, just from being in property management, you know, you don't discount the upstairs, you, you, you raise the first floor. And, and, and there's a bunch of other things that we did, uh, but we ended up filling it up. And, but we used a, um, you know, arm's length, uh, it must, his name was Leonard Litwin. You know, he's very bright, very smart, way smarter than me in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I, I would ask him questions just as you know, in a lot of ways, he was probably my first real estate mentor, but uh, I didn't get a lot of face time with him because he was so busy. But um, but I, when I did, I coveted it and and um, and it was a fair deal. It wasn't uh, wasn't a deep discount at all. Now, Ken, you're you're used to just like, you know, doing some property management. You've got a single family home. Maybe you've picked up one or two more at this time. But like, this is a big move to move yeah. um, property management on other people's stuff, you know, on your own asset. Maybe you only have one at the time. You jump to a $9 million purchase price. You've got to come up with $2 million. I've got to assume you didn't have this yourself. So what's the story there? How did you figure that out? Yeah, in the 90s too, you know, I was like, well, you know, the good thing when you're young is that you don't know any better. And and uh, I didn't know any better. And, and I literally, but I, I'm, I, I'll outwork. That's why I, that's kind of a wrestler I was too is I might not have been the strongest and fastest, but you know, there was nobody who was gonna outwork me. And, 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 and so that's what I did. And we just started knocking on doors, calling, you know, back then we'd have the internet and, and um, you know, trying to figure out people that, that had money. And, um, you know, I started with yeah, my rich uncle, everybody had my rich uncle, even though uh, he didn't invest, the lesson from him was invaluable. And, you know, cause you're asking all the wrong questions. You're doing all the wrong things. You, you're looking at all the wrong things and you have all the wrong assumptions uh, and you think you do, but you don't. And, and so when people like Mr. Litwin or my uncle can come in and say, Hey, these are things that you should be looking at. Then you slowly change your pitch. You slowly change your business plan. And, and we ended up, um, I ended up raising money through my attorney uh, at the time and his buddies, uh, and, uh, he was a real estate attorney. He's still my attorney, by the way. And, um, uh, and a, you know, incredible friend and, and, um, he, he turned me on to his buddies. And, you know, as you know, what the power of the math, like, you know, what's you, what's they, what's they saw the deal and they start to see the return and they were excited about the senior market. Cause even in the nineties, they were talking about the aging baby boomers, you know, now, it's kind of old news, but this is like, this is going to happen. And so I just kind of hung my hat on that and said, you know, this is, uh, you know, this lifestyle living, it's not, it wasn't assisted care or congregate care. It was lifestyle living um, is a, is something that, that um, and, and at the, you know, our, our turnover is almost nothing. People do not move uh, when they're seniors. It's, it's awesome. unless they have to, and which is rare. So uh, yeah. And, and it was just, uh, I didn't want to fail. So I did it. I love it. Well, and, and by the way, that that's I love hearing that story because I took a lot of pride early on in my career that I would outwork anyone. And that was a good differentiator because most people won't work that hard. So when you are willing to do it and when you have, uh, you know, the resume to back it up or, or the reputation to back it up, it is much easier to raise money. 
I always tell people, you know, because when I first started, it took me a long time to get into real estate. I wanted to do real estate a lot longer than I was actually doing real estate because I had this limiting belief in my mind that I had to have the money to be able to do the deal. And it took me, you know, a handful of years to figure out, no, this is holding me back. I actually just need to go find the deals. And if the deal is good enough, the money will show up. And, and that's the truth. The money, like you have a good deal, trust me. Money is the easiest thing to come by, even when you don't have it. So at a certain point in your life, like, you know, th there's this whole idea around scarcity of money. And when you don't have any, it's very scarce, but it's truly an abundant resource. And when you have the thing that others want who have money, it is really easy to raise it. And I know you've experienced that as well. Yeah, I, I had the same I, you know, I was taught the same as everybody else. I, I believed that you had to have a bunch of money in the bank. You had to have in, in the beginning, Justin, I was, I was going out and saying, Hey, if I find a good deal, would you invest? And every, the answer was always yes, of course. But then, you know, when, when, uh, the time came, you know, they were nowhere and, and <laughs> um, you know, but the, you, 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 what happened, what I did find is that the, the, the deal drives the, the investor. So I always, you know, we, 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 Robert and I, as you know, I kind of skipped over the whole books and all that kind of stuff. Cause that's an, it's a significant piece, but uh, it's really my kind of give back education piece is writing all the books. But Robert and I were at a conference in New York uh, with Trump. And um, I remember this, we were walking through the Javits center and there's these booths and, you know, all these booths, you know, trying to sell stuff around real estate, you know, some of them were down in the Caribbean, some of them were, you know, uh, you know, passport issue stuff, and some were in Mexico, and some were local, and we walk up to these two just gorgeous girls with this big, uh, beautiful black and white photo, and they're two, you know, two models standing next to it, and, and you look at the table, and it's like a, it's like a bound book, you know, it's beautiful, right? And um, I, so we were walking through and we were just grabbing stuff and, and, and going into the green room, getting ready to speak. And I'm sitting there looking at all the stuff. And I said, I go to Robert, I go, look at this brochure, you know, this is probably five or 10 bucks, just this one. I go, you know, the deal, it's, it's interesting. I go, the bigger the brochure, the worse the deal. <laughs> and, and he started laughing and we started saying uh, kind of to your point, like, like deals get done almost on a napkin now, like the high math, you know, uh, obviously it's not perfect, but if I called you up right now and I said, Hey, you know, we buy it for this. It's got a $20 million value add. we got to put this much in it. And I've already got a debt quote. You would say in now there's a zillion things that I have to prove out, you know, but a lot of people don't realize that that uh, investors are sitting on a bunch of money and they're typically in their bank account and 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 or they're making a bunch of money or and their companies are kicking off a bunch of money and a lot of times their options are the financial planners or the stock market so they're just frothing for for guys like us that can bring them something that provides cash flow tax free and and that's that was the the little secret justin that i didn't realize is that I was syndicating in the 90s and it wasn't a thing. And people were clamoring to find out how do I invest in an apartment building? And, and so the first one was hard, don't get me wrong. But then the second, and then I had to work my butt off to prove out the numbers. But then the next one is a little bit easier. And the next one became a little bit easier and the deal started getting bigger. And then the broker started to take a look, you know, they're like, oh, this guy is like buying buildings now. And, and then the debt guys show up and the, you know, like, you know, so all this stuff starts to happen as my friend says, way leads to way leads to way, you know, it's just things connect as you take, as you get into motion. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And so much of what you're saying is just spot on, especially with like the deal terms. And if, I mean, you hear the right deal and you're in, it doesn't take much. Like you can make a commitment, you know, in, in seconds. Um, and I love that you're so good about developing relationships with people that 
become long-term business relationships and then you be they become friendships and so you know you did this with your attorney we were talking about a few other people in your pipeline that you did this you did this with robert you've you've done that you've made a career of being able to have these long-term relationships and i think it's a big red flag when you've got someone that is an investor that is always kind of turning to new relationships. They, they can't keep the same vendors, clients, um, you know, wh whoever it is that they use like that to me is something to pay attention to. Like how long have you had investors? How long have you used the same uh, relationships and uh, brokers and lenders and whoever it might be? Uh, so I love that, that you do that. And I kind of have this philosophy that um, as long as someone in my network is an expert at the thing, if I'm going to spend money on it, I might as well do it inside my, my family, my family of friends. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so sometimes it's friends first and then I do business with them, but other times it's doing business with them and then we become friends and it's just such a rewarding relationship, you know? It is. It, you know, it's funny. I, I, um, uh, when my dad passed uh, 10 years ago, I got to learn all about hospice and all of that. And one of the things that I learned from hospice was the, 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 the top there, there are, as they measure them at the end of life, are people's top regrets. And one of those is relationships. I wish I would have forgiven. I wish I would have uh, mended a relationship. Uh, literally, those are at the top. I mean, just go Google it. And, and so I, I, when I, when I, um, obviously, you know, when, when that something like that happens, you, you know, you can, you have to evaluate things, you have to evaluate your relationships with your people, and you just never know when that is. And so for me, I was already headed down that track. But then it just solidified all of it. And, and, um, and so I am, a, you know, I'm relationship first. Um, and, um, you know, and business is actually pretty low on the on the on the on the category for me. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, with so, for example, let, let's just use Robert. You guys have been friends for a long time. Uh, There's a point in time before you knew him. You've had success, you know, before you ever met Robert. But you guys became great friends. Your neighbors now. You're you're super close. I mean, it, in many senses, it's you guys travel almost everywhere together, which is so cool to see. And you both speak so highly of the other person. But um, how did you guys meet? And how did you broker this uh, relationship? Yeah. Because when you take two people that have their own unique set of superpowers and you combine them. You know, that's where you get that one plus one equals five. And I feel like that's exactly what you guys have had. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, so, you know, what happened was, uh, obviously, and we talked about my first building and then I bought another one. And, and, I, and I have a partner too, Ross McAllister, who's, we merged our companies uh, as well. Uh, and and uh, that made us stronger. He's a general contractor. And so we were, and he's uh, a little bit older than me and, and, and has a little more experience too. So the two of us together, uh, we're still together. Um, and and uh, he's an incredible friend. And, um, and so um, what happened was, what does happen, as you know, is all of a sudden you're like, okay, this is working. <laughs> Our investors are happy. We're making money. Let's try to scale it. And so that happened. And then I, I joined EO, you know, uh, it used to be called YEO at the time, and, um, and, and uh, which is Entrepreneurs Organization. And, and in, my, uh, we, in my EO chapter, there was a guy that knew Robert and I was raising capital. I mean, plain as day, I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm out buying properties and I'm looking for capital. And, and if you guys know anybody that, that is interested, let me know. And so I, I got a referral. Um, I called Robert and I met him and Kim at the, at, um, the uh, Phoenix Country Club because they were living in Phoenix at the time and they had a home in Hawaii. They had just sold their business and Rich said Portet had just been released. So this would have been what, 20, almost 25 years ago, I guess. And, and I, I um, uh, and I, 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 sat down with him and, and uh, well, first of all, the first thing I did is I, I, I'm like, okay, if I'm gonna meet this guy, I better go buy his book and read it. So I, I, I went to the store, I bought the book, I read it in one night. 
I met with them the next day. And, and of course I made that the topic like you would. And, and, um, and then for about a year, they passed on everything. <laughs> they just said, sorry, it's not for us. Sorry, it's not for us. And they owned a little 12 unit and some other stuff. And they had just literally, you know, they were on this kind of high with Rich Dad Poor Dad. It was not the phenomenon that it is today. And, um, and then he asked me, he's like, hey, do you want to you know, come to one of my events? I swear this is true. I, I'm like, sure, yeah, I'll come. What is it? You know, I had no idea he did seminars or anything. And and um, he's like, yeah, I teach this, you know, this seminar, uh, and it's in Cave Cave Creek, Arizona. I'm like, okay, I'll be there. So I forgot. <laughs> so oh. so I, on Sunday morning, I woke up. I was supposed to be there Friday or Saturday. I completely forgot. Uh, Sunday morning, I woke up. I'm like, oh my gosh, I completely blew off Robert. And so I had flip flops on, shorts, and a t shirt. I jumped in my car and I drove up. I'm like, oh my God, I, got, I need to go up and at least apologize. So I walk in and there's like 400 people in the room. And it's a full seminar, you know, there's all this stuff going on on the walls and there's stages. And and he's, he sees me come in. He's like, Kenny, come on up to the room. He doesn't care that I didn't, wasn't there the first two days. And they have obviously enough going on. So I go up on stage. First time I've been on stage. And he's like, tell them what you do. And he walked off. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and it was right before lunch. And uh, I remember Kim came up to, you know, kind of handle me a little bit. Because I was just like, what am I doing here? And, and I was completely not dressed very well either. So uh, everybody's all, you know, in sport coats and you know, I'm in t-shirt and shorts. Um, and, um, and then uh, she's like, you're going to get swamped. Cause all I did was talk about what I was working on. And then that's when I realized that there's all these people out there trying to learn. I had no idea. I'd never been to a, anything like this. And um, so uh, I said, this is kind of cool. You know, there's all these people wanting all this information and, and, and all of a sudden I had some more investors. So I was like, Oh, this is pretty good. And, and, and so I'm like, maybe I should do a little bit more of this. He's like, I, I'd like you to write a book for, you know, based on what you've done. I'm like, well, I have no idea how to write a book. So then I found somebody to help me do that and, and kind of bumbled through that. And that's the, that's how the ABCs of real estate investing uh, came out. And, and, and then, then that opened more doors, as you know, you know, to radio shows. And, you know, so, you know, like, like, uh, you know, you have your book, right? So, um, you know, and so, you know, those kinds of things, they open doors and, and get you in spots that maybe you wouldn't be at and uh, from a speaking standpoint or on a radio or whatever. Now they're all podcasts and things like that. But so that's how it started. And then I, I started traveling with them because I wanted to learn how to speak better. I wanted to um, learn how to, um, you, you know, articulate from stage and, and I wanted to see the world. And so we went all over the world together. Um, and now I've now written six books, I think, uh, but we've been to Russia, Asia, Australia, multiple times, Europe, all over Europe, all over the US, Canada, um, Mexico, Spain, uh, you name it, Bolivia, like, so I just go when I can uh, around my family, I put my family first. And so, uh, and I would bring them on a lot of those trips. So I brought them to a bunch of those places as my kids were growing up and, and just kind of made it a family affair. And, and it was a, just the whole thing was just awesome. And th at the same time, running my business, growing the company, buying assets, and um, obviously uh, did very well uh, by Robert and Kim uh, and grateful that they had the confidence in, in our company. That's such a fun story. Yeah. And it's so great being able to do life with, with people and to get past the surface level stuff where you can really live and travel and break bread and just experience the, the depth of what uh, a true relationship with time spent uh, means. And, uh, and for what it's worth, I loved your book. Your book, The ABCs of Buying Rental Property, was the third book I read in the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series. I've read every book, but it was the first book I ever read on real estate. 
And uh, so I remember I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I was like, this is incredible. Holy cow. How did I not know about this? What a, what a mindset shift. And then when I read Cashflow Quadrant, I was like, just totally blown away. <laughs> yeah. I was like, how did I have another level of mindset shift? And then I read your book and I was like, man, I got to get in the game. And at that point in time, I was in Chicago and I kept on walking by, I lived in Lincoln Park and I would walk by these three flats and four flats and I just wanted to buy one so bad. And, uh, and so reading your book, I was like, man, this is possible. I can do this. I need to start making moves towards it versus, you know, not just, just laying in this uh, limiting belief space where I think I have to have the money. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, it was really neat when we got a chance to meet uh, yeah. because when we, when we officially met, I hadn't even connected the dots yet. When you said, <laughs> oh yeah, you know, that I was that guy that wrote it. I was like, oh, you, you yeah. hold a special place in my heart. Thank that's you. awesome, I, Ken. I appreciate it. I, I tell you what, that's uh, my partner just laughs. He's like, that is the book that just keeps on giving. You know, it's, it's been, it's been wonderful. I'm actually revising it right now because it's a bit dated uh, just on some rents and things like that, as you would imagine from, from over the years. So uh, I'm coming out with a, the a new revised version next year, but uh, that book has been great. Uh, tried and true. It's a, a true story about, uh, you know, buying a, an eight unit building and how to do it. And, and uh, it was, uh, it was fun to write. That's so great. Uh, you know, it's interesting because you talked about how, and I remember when we first met, you're like, yeah, Robert had me on stage. I didn't even know I was going to talk. And he's like, all right, just talk. And uh, you're like, oh, I was kind of wasn't prepared for it, but it was my first speaking engagement. But then you went on to do a lot of speaking with him. And then also with one of my other favorites, Tony Robbins. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I learned that you not only spoke on stage with him, uh, and I believe it was at Wealth Mastery, but I think you were the youngest speaker Tony had ever had is that right oh yeah 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 you know again like like Justin you just gotta like put yourself out there and you just gotta you, you gotta put things in motion and anybody listen I I grew up like you very uh humbly uh, you know and, and and thinking that there was a you know this is where I was going to be for the rest of my life and and uh and I just continue to work hard and what happens is People recognize as you put stuff out there, you put books out there, you put podcasts out there, you, and and uh, all of a sudden one day Tony uh, Tony called and uh, you know and and Robert and Tony have history too, which I didn't know, uh, you know a good history of, of studying together years ago and and the the industry is very very interesting and and it's a lot more collaborative than people might think. Um, and I, of course, because I make a lot of money on my real estate, I don't even know why I'm speaking. I'm not, I'm not getting paid. I'm <laughs> like trying to educate, you know, and, and I'm actually trying to figure that all out too. But at the same token, in the beginning, I was trying to hone my own speaking and try to figure that out and deliver good messaging and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and so I'm like, you know, trial by fire, I guess. And then, and then eventually kind of turn that into the more of a learning platform like yourself and, um, you know, put some real effort behind it and some people behind it and put some wind behind it. And, and so it's been a, it's been a heck of a fun journey, honestly, and, and just speaking with all these different folks uh, over the years. Yeah, it's, it's so neat to just see how these worlds collide and who knows who and you're because I mean, one conversation, one relationship and the trajectory of change uh, for the direction of your life, like the, the gravity of that one intersection is just mind boggling. Um, but I also love really what you've done on the charitable side. I know you talked about it a little bit and I'd love to give you a chance to share because one of the things for me that's so important um, with my book, with the Lifestyle Investor, I really wanted to not only educate people on how to be financially free, to create financial freedom. So it's a, you know, th there's opportunities to impact mindset uh, where people can, can take not only that, but shift the behavior and have the, the tangible, practical application to be able to do it. 
But moreover than that, there are so many people that don't even have basic human rights and, and human freedoms. And so I wanted the money of the book, the profits to go towards uh, charitable organizations. And so all the profits of Lifestyle Investor have gone to an organization I love shining the light on, Love Justice International, because they are stopping human trafficking in 17 countries around the world. In fact, they're, they're opening nine more locations and they're just doing incredible work. They rescued uh, over 500 kids last month. It's really an incredible thing that they're doing. And I just, you know, it gives me so much joy to, to see the impact that, you know, this, this focus energy and, and, you know, really just the, the, you know, the book itself has been able to create, and I know you're doing the same thing with your organization. And I know you started a nonprofit and you have raised over a million dollars for, um, your nonprofit or the nonprofits you've been part of. Uh, over the last decade. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Well, I think what happened in the beginning, I, I don't think that I, um, you know, I was a check writer, like a lot of people, and I did it for tax reasons. And, and uh, it wasn't really meaningful. And, and then when I, when I started to get involved, what happened was a friend of mine's son uh, was diagnosed with autism. And uh, this is years ago. And uh, before autism is, you know, uh, it, this is back in the day when I really didn't have a lot of notoriety. And, and um, so I got involved with just a simple walk and I started doing you know, almost like a March of Dimes walk. And it was a small uh, growing movement and, and it grew each year. And um, I was a volunteer. I'd go there, I'd get there at 5 a.m., help set up, help with registration, whatever, whatever it needed to do. I bring my kids and all that kind of stuff. And I realized when you see the faces of the folks and, and, the, and the stories and you start to you know, really connect with people, I realized that I needed to get more involved in things. And so that's when I started to, um, to be more intentional. And, and, and then, so that started from, from, a, from a physical standpoint. And then, then my friend, um, who, he started California Closets uh, and he was one of the founders at EO. Um, he uh, called and said, listen, I've got you know, only a year to live. And um, he got diagnosed with cancer. And so I'm like, well, okay. So then I really got involved. And I said, okay, I'm going to take this over. And I became the chairman of the walk for, for two years while he was recovering. And, um, and then I really got immersed into it. And, uh, and my whole company got immersed into it. And what that turned into was a full-time director of philanthropy. And in, in addition to that, my partner, Ross, he had some things happen in his family around cystic fibrosis. So the both of us, by this time, you know, the, the properties that we had owned were with, uh, you know, quite a bit and they were kicking off lots of cash. And so we said, okay, let's designate um, a bunch of money from our properties into these foundation and, 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 and bring on this, director so which we did and and then and that's just uh, really just taken off and so then what we did was we ended up um uh, doing partnerships with our vendors and and uh, so ross and i fund the majority but then our vendors fund and our employees get an opportunity to fund too and they actually um uh can write their own grants to their own charity so we i don't know exactly the number that we um we give out every year now, but it's a lot and the employees can uh, write their own grants and they, they go through a board and all that and, and then they get the grants to whatever charity makes them happy. So it's a, quite a few charities, um, you know, because we have 250 employees. So, but what really happened, which was really interesting, was we had quite a bit of money in the, in the foundation and then the pandemic hit and we didn't lay anybody off, of course, but um, some of the, our employees' uh, families had been severely impacted. You know, like maybe their husband or their wife had lost a job or parents or whatever. So we gave out, um, gosh, we were giving out five and $10,000 grants to families during that, out of our foundation to our own people. Uh, so that kind of got us through that period of time. And so, so the, 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 the charity thing has been really significant for us 
it's, it is one of our core values. We have five core values and one of them is be giving. And uh, if you look at our website, it's to invest, to live, to play, to give. Uh, that is what you'll see. And, you know, it's always primary uh, issue in our firm. And, um, and then as, as, um, as you would imagine, and, and not by any kind of design, the, that attracts a different kind of employee. Uh, and so um, we found that by having that, just by doing something that Ross and I wanted to do, um, our culture got better, stronger, deeper, and uh, tighter. And we started attracting very, very, very good people because they wanted to be part of something bigger than just making money. Ken, that is incredible. And I love that you were able to use your foundation to support your own team and staff in a time of, of need and of crisis. That, that is so cool. You know, it, it reminds me when I was younger, I had, so I didn't have a lot of mentors in, you know, investing or entrepreneurship or anything like that. I, I didn't know anyone when I was young that was a business owner or that invested as, you know, a, a profession. And so I remember that my mentors were authors. It was you, it was Robert, it was Tom Wheelwright. It was, you know, just a number of different people um, Stephen Covey. And I mean, just you name it, Napoleon Hill. I mean, th these are people that had a huge impact, whether they know it or not, Tony Robbins. And, um, and so the interesting thing is when I finally started meeting successful people, and I would say, Hey, how can I meet more people like you? Like, where would I hang out with them? The common theme was that I should uh, get involved in philanthropies. And when I was young, I was like, I don't want to do that. What I wasn't asking to like, you know, go give time somewhere or go donate somewhere. I want to know like, wh where are the people that are doing the thing that I want to do? And it's funny because over time I kept getting the same answer and finally it clicked for me. And that was, oh, the people that have figured it all out and are really successful in life and are so successful that they don't need to work, they're spending their time at these charities. They're donating their time, donating their resources. They're starting them themselves. They're sitting on the boards of them. And I'm glad in many respects that I didn't figure that out, that I was a little too hard-headed uh, because I, I, I would have, it would have been for the wrong reasons um, and so now, you know, I, I love it because uh, I've come full circle. I understand this and I love spending time there and, you know, time as far as treasures, right? Your, your time, your treasures uh, in these spaces for the right reasons. And it's amazing the, the fun uh, synergies and connections you can have with other like-minded philanthropists that value this in their life and in their business. Yeah, it's true. And I'll tell you, it really, you, you want, you want some purpose. Uh, and every time you want to maybe feel a little bit about bad about yourself or, or feel down, uh, all you got to do is go back to some of those moments. I know like, well, I climbed Kilimanjaro twice with my kids. Uh, well, each kid I brought up, uh, to, we, we summited, uh, and, uh, part of that trip is working in an orphanage for the blind in Africa. And, and I remember my son, um, my older son, who's coming over here in about an hour. Uh, he, he, I said, so, you know, what was your takeaway, you know, from the whole week uh, of that week and the climbing the mountain, which, you know, took another two weeks. Um, he said, um, I can't believe how happy these people are and how little they have. And, uh, and I was like, all right, good for you. You know, because that, so, so when you, when you, when you're around that stuff, and you immerse yourself in that stuff, uh, you start to realize how, how lucky, how grateful actually what we really are. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, I love that you're doing this with your kids and that this is you know, a family value for you. And it is for us too. I think you know, there's a lot that we uh, are, are very similar on. And I think that's probably, probably why we resonated so well when we, when we finally connected. 
Um, I, I'd love for my audience to learn more about you. Wh where can we find you? Well, thank you. Um, well, well, the the best way is kenmacroy.com and uh, you know it's k-e-n-m-c-e-l-r-o-y.com and uh, you know on there you're going to find all kinds of stuff it has links to get to the company which is mc companies uh, that's probably the best place you can you can look on there we do videos and blogs and newsletters and all that kind of stuff to kind of support people that are trying to figure out things in the real estate community we do have a something for your listeners, uh, we have at, at kenmacroy.com slash uh, lifestyle investor, they, they actually, we, have, we actually have a test that uh, says, what kind of investor are you? So you can maybe try that. Uh, it's kind of fun, you just, uh, you know, fill it out. It's, not very, it's like 25 questions, but it, it, it kicks right to your inbox. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of fun. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us and with our audience. And uh, I just got to say, I've had so much fun hanging with you here today. I, I say this often in my podcast that um, the people that I meet and get to know better, it's so fun. Like I want to do this anyway. And it's really neat that we get to share this with the world, you know? No, it's so true, Justin. I appreciate uh, your time and being on your channel. And I know uh, we're going to get you on mine and uh, you know, as, as you know, the world is uh, made up of reciprocity uh, and, um, you know, and, and I, I uh, one of my one of my mentors, uh, I, you know, when I was off base with somebody, she said to me, well, one of you is out of exchange. And I'm like, oh, that's a very interesting way to put it. And it was true. Uh, and, and, and I think that uh, people could learn that lesson. Just always try to be in exchange. Uh, you know, equal value. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's one of my philosophies. Oh, it's so cool. Well, thank you for sharing that and for your time. And I want to end this call as I end each call. And that is with this, what is one step you can take today towards financial freedom and towards a life on your terms, a life by design, not by default. Thanks. And we'll catch you next week.